Um, we're going to dive right in today because this story is really good. I'm going to tell you, like, as much sermon as there is, there's, like, as much on the cutting room floor at home. So I'm excited about Thomas, and I want to get going with it. Um, last Sunday on Easter, we heard John's account of the resurrection. Um, didn't Pastor Sarah just preach an amazing sermon? She's not here, but I feel like we should give her an applause offering for that sermon, right? Like, she took us through how John's resurrection theology is really unique. Jesus first appears to Mary, and in the midst of Mary's grief, Jesus calls her name, and she sees the Lord. And she goes out to the other disciples and tells them what she has seen. Now we pick up the, in the very next scene, that night. Mary has come and told them what she saw, but the disciples are still scared. They're hiding because they just saw Jesus executed in the most humiliating way possible. It was torture. And on top of it, after he was dead, they stabbed the body. He was a bloody mess. And when they buried him, they were scared. And three days later, they're still scared. So what will happen to them? Will the same religious authorities persecute them for following Jesus? Will the Romans execute them the same way? And most of all, who are they now? Was all this talk of love and new life, was it all just talk? So they're doing a very common thing that people who grieve do. They're gathered together. They're weeping together and they're hiding together. I mean, can you imagine the tension in the room? The fear, anger, the sadness, the hopelessness and the guilt. I mean, they probably can't decide if they wanna cry or puke or punch something. Can you relate to that feeling at all? And then Mary shows up. And what is she even talking about? I mean, she shows up with a story about a gardener and she thinks she saw Jesus. I mean, what the actual, like it has to sound crazy, right? Well, Sean is gonna come up and read that story for us and we'll see what happens next. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After this, he said, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Do you ever wonder if like right before Jesus appeared to the disciples, he ever considered being like, boo. <laughs> I mean, he kind of does, right? Like he just appears in the room. The door is locked, they're in a hiding place and somehow Jesus appears. And he starts with this old Jewish greeting, peace be with you. And they're all like, but wait, we saw Jesus. We saw what they did to you. We saw you crucified. We saw you bleed. We saw you die. And Jesus is like, yes, you did. And he rolls up his sleeves and show, shows the holes in his hands. And he hikes up his tunic and shows the gash on his side. And the text says, the disciples rejoiced. The tears come, they hug each other. They can't believe it. They are reunited at last. Don't you just dream of a joyful reunion like that? And then he does something incredible. He breathes on them. And he says, receive my Holy Spirit, or receive the Holy Spirit. It's interesting. Um, this is the Pentecost moment in John's gospel. We'll celebrate Pentecost in a few weeks. Um, it's that Christian festival that celebrates the arrival of the Holy Spirit and the formation of the church. And typically churches read from the book of Acts on Pentecost. Acts has that really dramatic telling of the story with fire and wind and speaking of tongues. But for the Johannine community in John's gospel, it happens here. It happens when Jesus appears in the upper room and breathes on the disciples. And this is really cool theology. It harkens back to Genesis. Remember, the Johannine community is deeply Jewish. And in the Genesis creation story, God forms the first human out of dirt and breathes into their nostrils. And that breath of God brings the first human to life. I worked with a rabbi at Harborview who told me that in certain Jewish traditions, Judaism still celebrates a baby's first breath. 
as the moment that God breathes into an infant's body and brings it to life. And this image of new creation is all throughout John's gospel. John's gospel begins with that poem about creation. And then the resurrected Jesus first appears as a gardener, just as God began creation in a garden. And now Jesus is breathing into the disciples, making them his new creation, just as God breathed into the first human. And Jesus commissions them saying, receive the Holy Spirit. And that's what he's been saying all along. He's leaving, but his spirit will be with them. And then he says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. This is the creation of the church in John's gospel. And the first task of the church is the forgiveness of sins. Isn't it funny that we can't manufacture our own forgiveness? Like my inner critic just will never let me off the hook. Richard Rohr says this, people cannot forgive themselves unless someone breathes on them and says, you are forgiven. Embodied presence is just so important. And that's what Jesus does here. He shows up offering peace to the same friends who abandoned him. He breathes on them and forgives them. Because Jesus knows the only way communities can hold together is through forgiveness. The only way community is built is when we show up as our honest, messy selves and we accept each other for being honest and messy. You know, one of the first times I experienced this was in Vietnam. I lived in Saigon for the better part of 2018, but I don't really talk about it much. Um, but when I lived in Saigon, it was the first time I ever went to a gay bar. And to be honest, it was kind of an accident. I was really just looking for good whiskey in a country that basically drinks pale lager. <laughs> but Whiskey and Wares um, was a gay bar right on the outside of the tourist district in Saigon, and it became my regular watering hole. And while I'd come out to my family before that, this was really like my first time hanging out in crowds of gay men as an out gay man. And there were times that we were so fearful, gathering as an international community and grieving for the persecution of queer people around the world. And there were times that we were vulnerable, comparing wounds and scars and saying, me too. And there were people from around the world that would show up and tell their stories and we'd be like, yeah, you're welcome here. You're part of our crew. That whiskey bar was such a formative part of my story. And it was there that I saw the Lord. Have you ever had a community like that? A community where you felt that you could show up as yourself? A community where people loved and cared for each other in such a way that you thought, wow, here I have seen the Lord. I mean, that's what the church can be. It can be a place where Jesus shows up among us. In the moments where we breathe together, in the moments where we are grieving and traumatized, in the moments where we are vulnerable and showing our wounds, in the moments where we look at each other and say, I see you, I hear you, you've already been forgiven for it all. God holds nothing against you, and we don't either. You're welcome here. You're part of our crew. Boy, my inner critic needs to hear that. God forgives me for not being strong enough and forgives me for being needy forgives me for walking away sometimes, forgives me for having a squishy little human heart with big feelings. It's amazing to hear that God asks nothing of you other than you might abide like a child in God's hands. And you know what? That is a hard thing to do alone. It is hard to abide in the loving embrace of God without a community. And that's a theme that becomes even more obvious in the next section of today's reading. Because wait, there's more. One of the 12... Thomas isn't there when all this happens. So his story gets a little extra interesting. And Sean's going to read that next. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Thomas is a fascinating character. It's from this story that we get the nickname Doubting Thomas. Has anyone heard that before? Have you ever heard it as kind of a put down, like don't be a Doubting Thomas? Um, or have you heard this text preached in a way that implies that doubts are bad? like doubts are a sign of weakness in some way. 
Well, to reduce Thomas's story to a single slur does not do Thomas justice. Because let's talk about Thomas. He's actually really a complex character. Thomas shows up in all four Gospels, but John specifically gives Thomas a big role. Thomas speaks three times in the Gospel of John, which is a lot of times for someone to speak in the Bible. The first time he speaks is back in the story of Lazarus, when Lazarus was sick. And all the disciples are scared that if Jesus goes to Judea to heal him, Jesus will die. Turns out they were right. But Thomas disagrees. He knows the risks and he says, let's do it. He says this, let me also go too, that I may die with you. Isn't that interesting? Thomas, whose name is so synonymous with doubt, originally shows so much faith. He totally believes that Jesus knows what he's doing. Thomas starts out as the one who believes. Like he starts out as the one who will run into the brink with Jesus. He totally believes that Jesus is who he says he is and that he can handle anything. Can you relate to that? Has there been something in your life that you were so passionate about, no one could talk you out of it? Maybe a job or a relationship, a cause that you champion, like nothing could hold you back. No matter what others said, you could see the risks and you were going in. Well, that's big Thomas energy. Like those big feelings, big passion, he is all in. The second time Thomas speaks is during Jesus's farewell speech that we spent Lent looking at. And Pastor Ryan preached on this a few weeks ago. When Jesus says he's leaving, Thomas says, I do not know where you are going. How can I know the way? So things have started to crack here. Fear is creeping in, but Thomas still can't give up. We still see Thomas faithfully wanting to go all, all in with Jesus. Like, where are you going, Jesus? I want to go with you. Show me the way. Have you ever experienced that? This thing that you were passionate about wasn't quite going the way you thought it would, but there was no way you were going to quit. You'd find a way. You'll keep going. That's the kind of grit that we see with Thomas. But you know, the funny paradox here, sometimes grit can be a coping mechanism. And sometimes belief itself can be a mask. Sometimes passion masks anxiety. And sometimes our big feelings get the better of us. And we see that this third time that Thomas speaks. It's here in today's text. Because Thomas wasn't at the tomb and he wasn't in the upper room when Jesus appeared. Don't you kind of wonder where he was? You know, I'm someone with big feelings. I can be pretty good at hiding them, but I can smile when I'm angry. And to be honest, I can't cry in a crowd. Like when I'm grieving or at my wit's end, I need to be alone. And alone, I can curl up in the fetal position and wail like a baby, but no one's gonna see it. I kind of wonder if that's what Thomas was doing. Like everyone felt the fear and the sadness and the guilt and the hopelessness, but maybe Thomas felt it a little more. Maybe he has a squishy little human heart and he couldn't let his big feelings show. So he went off to be alone. And when the disciples come to him and say, we have seen the Lord, Thomas makes his third statement in the Gospel of John. He says, unless I see the mark of nails in his, and put my fingers in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. It's not a very grammatically correct sentence that he says. <laughs> but think of this arc that um, John tells with Thomas. He's the only one who believes in Jesus when Jesus wants to go to Judea. He's by his side and completely committed. And then Jesus talks about leaving and Thomas is like, I'll go with you, show me the way. But then Jesus goes and he dies this humiliating death. Thomas watches his friend and mentor get tortured and he watches this God he believes in get executed. See, I wanna make sure that we don't just cast Thomas as an overanalyzer. His trauma is such an important part of the story. The violence he witnessed has changed him. I know that to be true for me. I know that in my moments of loss or fear, I want someone to give me answers. And those answers had better include the wounded reality that I saw. I mean, if we aren't talking about pain, what are we talking about? Don't speak to me of resurrection when I'm like this. Show me something tangible that I can hold on to. Doesn't trauma do that to us? Doesn't it make us want answers? Doesn't it make us fixate on the wounds? I mean, I don't believe Thomas's faith is weakened. I think Thomas's heart is shattered by disappointment. I think disappointment is actually one of the reasons I don't talk about Vietnam. Because I followed this arc that Thomas followed. 
I was living in Prague with some great roommates and an awesome community of friends. And our work visas were starting to expire. Some people were renewing their visas to stay, and some people were moving home, and people were getting visas to go to other countries. And Vietnam had become a popular place that a lot of my friends were going. Um, that said, it wasn't without its challenges. Vietnam um, had a different visa process and completely separate from how it worked in the EU. There were vaccines we were all required to get, and work for expats was really irregular. And statistically, Vietnam was dangerous. I mean, Vietnam has the most traffic fatalities in the world, with an average of 31 per day in Saigon alone. But I was like, no, I can do this. Bring on the danger. Bring on the adventure. Me and Jesus, take the wheel. We got it. But from the minute I arrived, it was hard. It was scorching hot until 3 p.m., and then the sky would open up with these monsoonal flooding rains every single day. I was teaching English, and work was only available on the evenings and weekends, so it was hard to meet people. Even with a nice community at the gay bar, I often worked when others were hanging out. And the food was amazing, but food poisoning was a bi-monthly occurrence. And then there was all the corruption. Every day was just exhausting. But I wasn't going to give up. I'm Zach. I can do it. I have grit. But you know what grit did to me? I became really cynical. And cynicism is often the last-ditch effort of not being disappointed. And I remember calling my dad one time and being like, I think I'm becoming a mean person. And he was like, no, Zachary, you just had a bad day. I was like, no, you don't understand. This is who I am now. Like, this is what living in Vietnam does to you. Have you ever been in that headspace? Like, don't tell me it's just a bad day. Don't speak to me of resurrection or hope. This is my reality. These are my wounds. Because in the end, I couldn't admit how miserable I was. I couldn't admit how hard life has become, had become. I couldn't admit I was disappointed and exhausted and scared. So instead, I just put up a wall. Everyone else was an idiot. That explained it. And I think of this with Thomas. I think Thomas has been so faithful. He's been so determined and so committed. But death and crucifixion, that is too much. And now there's talk of resurrection. I think the truth for Thomas is he can't risk hope because the risk of hope is too painful. Can you relate to Thomas at all? Has there been a time in your life when it was hard to admit how scared or fragile or broken or disappointed you felt? Have you ever been too scared to hope because the hurt was just too much? Well, it's interesting what happens next. A week passes, and after a week, the disciples gather again. And this time, Thomas is there. And you know what happens? Jesus appears. Sean's going to read about it. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you can see me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. I think it's interesting that Thomas sees Jesus when he's with the community. Isolation is a terrible thing for a scared, grieving, traumatized person. We need each other. And that's what made Vietnam so hard for me. Between the weather, the language barrier, the erratic work schedule, it was so isolating. And I remember one particularly hard period where my roommate was out of the country, and the gay bar was closed for construction, and I was only getting weekend clients for English lessons, I was so bored and scared and miserable. And I went to get pho for lunch, which I did eat other things, but this story involves pho. And I'd been there for a few months, but eating soup with chopsticks was not my skill set. And this man who worked there came over, and he saw me struggling, and he sat down. And without speaking a word, he began to show me how to tear the little basil leaves into smaller pieces so they flavored the soup. And he showed me how to knock the seeds out of the peppers so you could control the spice. 
And he showed me how to use the spoon and the chopsticks together so you got a little bit of broth with each bite. And in this simple exchange, not a word was spoken, but this act of compassion made me feel so seen and loved and cared for. I saw the Lord. And when I was done eating, I went up to pay and there was um, this article by the cash register and um, it was translated in English in a Word document. And it turns out that this man had been a top official for the Viet Cong. He fought against the US troops for years and he taught me to eat pho. I saw the Lord. I read something this week that said, Thomas doesn't doubt Jesus. Thomas doubts the testimony of the community. And this is a turning point in John's gospel. Up to this point, Jesus has been doing signs to show people that he is the I am. And now Jesus is leaving. His physical presence will no longer be a sign. All that's left is the community. The community will be a sign. Thomas resists the idea that the community is enough. Which you know is fair, because communities tend to suck. <laughs> communities are full of wounded people. There is just no other type of community out there. And I've seen a lot of communities tell me what Jesus is like. And I'm like, oh, nope, that is not the Jesus I know. And there are the obvious examples, of course. There are communities that say Jesus is a homophobe or Jesus is a racist or Jesus is a white guy or that he has a particular sexual ethic or political affiliation. And obviously those communities don't speak accurately of Jesus. But there are less obvious examples that are hard to trust. I mean, it can be hard to trust a community that says in the midst of fear, we are gonna breathe together and trust that Jesus is here. It can be hard to trust a community that says we are gonna be vulnerable with each other. It can be hard to trust a community that says we are gonna forgive each other. And yet that's the type of community we need because when we do those things, we see the Lord. And one of the brilliant theological things that John's gospel does is have Thomas represent you and me. There's like four pages of the sermon on my um, office back home where I like prove this to you and I don't have time to go through it. So you have to listen to the podcast later. <laughs> but Thomas represents all the believers who come next. All Thomas has to go off of is the testimony of the community, which is the same for you and me. You and I weren't there. We didn't get to see Jesus. So Thomas does what we often do. He becomes defensive. And when he lets down his guard and shows up in the community, he sees the Lord. It turns out that community is the place that Jesus appears. And I think it's important that we think about this when we hear what Jesus says next. Because at the very end here, Jesus says, blessed are those who believe without seeing. I think it's easy to read this as Jesus admonishing Thomas for not believing, like kind of this finger wagging Jesus. But remember what we've talked about this whole series. Belief is about allowing yourself to be held by Jesus. Belief is about surrendering your ego. Belief is about laying down the things you carry and letting God love you. So the lesson from Thomas is the only way that kind of belief happens is in community. Alone, we're too blinded by our griefs and our traumas and our fears and our disappointments, our big emotions. But when we gather and practice breathing together, showing our wounds, rejoicing together, and forgiving one another, Jesus appears. We see Jesus, which is hard because it means we have to risk disappointment. We have to risk getting hurt. We have to risk having our big squishy emotions seen by others. And yet somehow in the mess of that risk, Jesus appears. We just can't see Jesus on our own. To experience resurrection, we need the loving compassion of others. We need those gay bars where people say, me too. We need those friends who sit and breathe with us. We need those people who look us in the eye and say, you are forgiven. We need people to take the time to teach us how to eat pho. Because in those moments, Jesus appears. I wonder where this has been true in your story. Where have there been times that you came out of isolation and were met by the grace of beloved community? Or said another way, where have you seen Jesus? God's dream for you is that you would have such a community. And God's dream for Salt House is that we would be such a community, that we may breathe together, that we may show our wounds, that we may rejoice 
and that we may offer each other peace and forgiveness. And you know, Salt House, in the three years I've been here, I've seen Jesus here with us. I've seen Jesus appear in making s'mores with the youth at Spark. I've seen Jesus at countless queer brunches. I've seen Jesus appear in Advent yoga. I've seen Jesus in bringing my boyfriend to church, especially the time he came in drag. I've seen Jesus appear in Thanksgiving dance parties. I've seen Jesus appear in foot washing rituals. Time and time again, Jesus has appeared amongst us. Where have you seen Jesus? So this Easter season, because as Pastor Ryan said, it is 49 days long, this story of Thomas has an invitation for you. How might you show up in community to see Jesus? Is it in a small group? Is it in volunteering? Is it in going out for coffee with someone? How might you show your wounds? How might you share your disappointments or your hurts with another person? How might you ask for forgiveness? Or how might you offer it to another? How might we remind each other that resurrection happens? Because when we do these things, Salt House, surely Jesus will appear. Amen.